Welcome everybody. Hello. Uh, it's always exciting to be hosting another office hours uh, on the Rivas community side and with the Open Education Network. My name is Apurva Ashok. I'm the Director of Open Education at Rivas Community. Um, and I want to start off by first acknowledging that I am uh, coming to you today from a warm but very gray um, Gray City, I'm located on the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the First Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And I'm very grateful to be uh, enjoying some warmer weather and enjoying some rain on this lovely Tuesday. Uh, you may also know this city as Toronto, Canada. As I noted, I work at the Rebus community. Rebus is a Canadian charity that helps um, educational institutions build human capacity in OER publishing and open education through a variety of ways, including free resources, professional development, and webinars like this one. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the office hour sessions are co-organized with the Open Education Network, and I'm gonna turn it over to Karen to tell you a little more about her and the Open Education Network. Thank you, Aperva. We are happy to be here as always in uh, hosting office hours with you and the Rebus community and with everyone else on this call. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm with the Open Education Network and we are a community of professionals in higher education working together to make things more open and equitable. Today we are joined by four guests and we are going to be talking about OER and instructional design. And we're calling it part two because we had a discussion last month that was lively and very engaging and um, we just wanted to continue with that momentum. And so today we're gonna talk specifically about student-centered OER development. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our guests. They will talk for a few moments um, about their experience with the topic and then we will look to you for um, the conversation and questions. And so um, before we get started, I will say that while the OEN is based at the University of Minnesota, I am coming to you from San Luis Obispo, California, which is the ancestral home of the Northern Chumash. And with that, I will uh, let you know who we are joined uh, by today. Uh, Ivana Yannick is here with us. She's the educational developer at the University of Manitoba. Also Veronica Bold, Open Educational, excuse me, Open Education Instructional Designer with Open Oregon. Brenna Clark Gray, who's coordinator with the Educational Technologies area at Thompson Rivers University. And Nicholas Perez, who is Teaching and Learning Specialist with the University of Denver. And so to get us started, I'm going to turn things over to Veronica. Thank you, Karen, and good morning, everyone. I, uh, Veronica Vold, she, her pronouns, coming to you um, from Eugene, Oregon. Uh, this is the, um, I live on stolen land uh, that was originally uh, belonged to the Kalapuya Ehili, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron, um, the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians, and the Wine Valley. And I'm really thrilled uh, to, to be with you uh, and take this hour together to explore student-centered design and equity at the heart of open educational resources. And I wonder if we would begin um, by just starting with some breaths together. Um, often when we talk about equity, we're dipping into some really deep experiences of exclusion and privilege, and it's an emotional journey. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to use a technique that my kindergartner last year um, taught me called volcano breaths. So just to set us off, if you would mind loosening your shoulders up a little bit, we're going to do three special kinds of breaths. These are volcano breaths. So you're going to raise your arms above your head if you feel comfortable and inhale. And then we're going to release that breath like lava flowing down. So we're gonna do that together. All right, so first breath, we're gonna inhale. Exhale. And let's do that one more time. We're gonna inhale. Exhale. Ooh, yeah. Thank you. 
a big part of my work uh, as the open education instructional designer is being with faculty and instructors as they are surviving the COVID-19 pandemic and living in an era of racial uprising and renewed awakening for dominant cultures and people who are occupying a lot of power uh, in their institutions. And in my experience so far, I've started this job supporting all 24 public colleges and uh, universities in Oregon for about five months now. And repeatedly, as I'm meeting with people in these little Zoom spaces that we hold and hearing about the, um, the yearning and desire they have to support their students uh, in, in meaningful learning experiences, what I notice is a physical response um, that this doesn't just sit in our intellectual capacities, but this work actually rests in our bodies. And for many of us, uh, the histories that we've lived through, the histories that our families and our generations have lived through, um, also surface and are present in the conversations we have. I wanted to start by sharing a quote from James Baldwin, the uh, African-American novelist and uh, cultural critic uh, as he helps us to center that history. James Baldwin uh, said in 1965 in Ebony Magazine, history, as no one seems to know, is not merely something to be read, and it does not refer me merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways. And history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is to history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. To me, when we start to focus on student-centered instructional design, and open educational resources, we have the opportunity to confront the history living within us and around us, to start to think critically about the legacies of exclusion and control that uh, entered the room before we did. Student-centered and equity-centered instructional design in open education doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen just by virtue of something being open or by virtue of something being OER-enabled pedagogy. It really is a journey of intention and of deep listening. One of the stories I wanted to share with you was the um, opportunity I had in my capacity in the statewide role to start an uh, open education instructional design community of practice. So colleagues from all over the state of Oregon who are working in higher education, uh, instructional design in higher education have an opportunity to come together and we focused our time once a month on thinking through questions of equity in open education. And repeatedly the, the urge has come up in our consultations, those one-on-one -on -one consultations with instructors and faculty um, to move at the speed of trust, that we are developing relationships that require trust, that require being seen in order to talk about the experiences that students are having in classrooms that we design. And there's frustration with that. Um, the one-on-one -on -one, uh, relationship building and the one-on-one -on -one conversations are so meaningful and so important, but the operational agency around that instructor or around that relationship also create the conditions for the conversation itself. I recently read an awesome article on the intentional agency versus operational agency that instructional designers engage when they're talking about open educational practices. And I'd like us to consider in this hour together how, how we can move and build capacity for operational agency. Our intentional agency is what we can bring to, to a consultation or to a conversation. Whose voices are we centering? Are we building a course for the full universe of learners, for students with disabilities, students of color, first generation students, students who are documented or undocumented, um, students who are queer or trans? Are we representing their voices? Those are really important conversations to have and they represent um, what this article referred to as our intentional agency, the intention or the ethics that we're bringing to the conversation. The big shift is to operational agency. 
how we have uh, the capacity to put concrete action behind the intention. So are our institutions investing in instructional design and equity? Are our institutions creating professional development that focus equity and open educational practices? Is senior leadership investing in those individual conversations and reflecting on its value for students? The other thing I wanted to encourage us to consider in our time together today is our relationships with uh, DEI coordinators and units on our campuses. Often offices of online learning, units that are dedicated to instructional design, uh, offices that are dedicated to teaching and learning uh, don't necessarily have strong relationships or connections with the offices that are dedicated to holding an institution accountable to its values for students. So that's one thing I'd love to open up together in our time is what is your relationship with your uh, diversity and equity and inclusion office or coordinator on your campus? And then finally, I also wanted to share a really exciting project that Open Oregon Education, Educational Resources has taken up. Uh, we have an equity and open education cohort that is uh, created by Amy Hoffer and Jen Claudini from uh, Portland Community College. And 60 plus faculty members historically have come together to focus on a four week course where they talk together about culturally responsive pedagogy and universal design for learning and universal design in general and open pedagogy. And we're starting a, a new cohort that's focused on teaching and learning support in particular so that all of the teaching and learning colleagues who are involved in creating learning experiences can come together, share their, their stories and talk about how to advance and champion open education on their campuses. So those are just a few stories that I wanted to share with you. And I also wanted to offer us this final quote from Tressie uh, McMillan uh, Cottom. This is from 2015, pre-pandemic. Uh, this is in response um, to a wonderful international conference on distance learning and online learning. Trusty says, what I do need are specifics about how this moment is not like those other moments, those old moments of educational expansion that were shaped by powerful white interests, wealth and racism to expand access without furthering justice. In my sense, in the relationships I'm building, in my capacity to talk with institutions, um, many institutions in a single meeting, is that this is a moment of change and transformation. Um, the pandemic has taken so much from us and continues to take so much from us, especially those who are most vulnerable. Uh, and we have an opportunity to shift and to recenter our priorities in open education, to think critically about what we are doing um, to advance equity for our students and not to repeat patterns that privilege wealth, that privilege white interest, and to uh, center justice in our expansion. And I don't wanna to take too much time. I wanna pass it on to our next person to continue our conversation. Karen, would you share who our next person is? Sure, Ivana, over to you and thank you, Veronica. Yeah, thank you. Hello, Dzień dobry. Uh, my name is Ivona Gniadek, uh, she, her pronouns, and I'm located on Treaty 1 territory in what is now Manitoba, Canada, the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. I also want to acknowledge Treaty 3 and Treaty 5 lands, which supply my home with tap water and hydro. I've been a settler on these lands since 2007, and I'm originally from Poland. Um, my journey with OER started in 2009 when I joined English Online, uh, a publicly funded settlement and language training organization for immigrants to Manitoba. The director was an avid OER supporter and advocate, so we shared our content on the English Online website and uh, incorporated open practices in teaching and learning. For example, we built self-directed open courses on Wikispaces, if anybody remembers Wikispaces. And uh, then I moved um, from English Online to the University of Manitoba, uh, where I design non-credit and for credit courses. And here, for example, some HR courses included optional social media activities, specifically Twitter, 
um, so that learners could find like-minded professional peers outside of the course and engage in, in digital identity formation and, and expression. And I also had an opportunity to incorporate open badges as social currency to foster peer-to-peer -peer engagement. And today I'd like to share with you some OER tools that I use uh, during the design process. And these tools help me and instructors focus on centering learners' needs, desires, context when developing OER. I always say to instructors, people first, then content and technology. So the first tool is called a persona, and I'm going to share um, a link in the chat. And um, So the, the folder has some templates that I use and an example. Um, and I use the, the persona tool specifically to build a, a shared understanding of who we are designing for. So we don't think about a faceless crowd of students or people, but we focus on specific individuals and um, also to build empathy for, for the learners. So the personas have a, a photo, have a name, they're detailed, so we can easily empathize with the person we're designing for. And I invite in instructors to create the learner personas with me and uh, based on their knowledge and experience with, with their past or, or future learners. So I'll give you an example of a current project. I'm currently working on a self-study OER resource focusing on incorporating equity, diversity, and inclusion in teaching, and uh, which I'm co-developing with a committee of representatives from eight partner institutions in Manitoba. And as a committee, we engage in creating a set of personas, one for each institution. And when we, once we compiled the results, we understood how diverse the audience is ranging from trades instructors to tenured professors nearing the retirement, instructors working at urban universities and small, small rural colleges. So the audience is very diverse. And ideally, you would perhaps want to build multiple resources, right, targeting different audiences. But we have a, a brief for one. Um, so the personas helped us um, build a, a shared understanding of, of who our audience is and, and suggest content and pedagogical approaches to address their needs. So for example, we talked about including scenario-based activities to, to build empathy, relationship building activities, a glossary of terms, a statistical discussion of enrollment and completion of various learner groups. We also want the the resource to be fully downloadable so that folks in areas where the internet is patchy can download and study offline. So, and, and, and these are ideas linked to specific personas in, our, in the set that we've created. And um, the persona can also be used to empower learners and support their agency. In, in one course, I shared the personas with my learners. And in this case, the persona descriptions were accompanied by suggested learning pathways through an online course. And learners were tasked to review the personas and choose one that matched them and follow the suggested pathway. And if there was no match, learners were encouraged to draw their own persona and speak to a facilitator to build a personalized learning plan, depending on their interests and goals. So the learner is, was always at the center, is always at the center when uh, with the persona activity. And uh, the second tool uh, that's also the template is on the, in the folder is called Transition Matrix. And the Transition Matrix um, is a story told by the learner persona about the learning change that they've experienced as a result of engaging in a learning experience. So the story starts with an initial state uh, before taking a course and then ends with a target state. And the target state is illustrated by some tangible outputs which naturally lead towards specifying lear learning objectives, which, which some, or sometimes are, are difficult conversations to have when we, when we design courses. So if you're looking for tools to create learner-centered OER, I, I highly recommend uh, using those two tools to, to guide your conversations and, and learning design decisions. 
me, thank you. And over to Brenna. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, I warned the uh, organizers at the beginning, but my kiddo is homesick from school today, so he may arrive. He usually chooses the in the middle of like the most genius thought to appear with some uh, unspecified need. So just a heads up. Uh, my name is Brenna Clark Gray. I'm coordinator of educational technologies at Thompson Rivers University. Um, I'm an uninvited settler in Tecumloops Te Sequetum in the unceded traditional land of Sequetum Ulu. Um, and I also like to reflect that my journey to this space has also been shaped by time spent in Algonquin Anishinaabeg, in Mi'kma'ki and Wolastique, and in Kikite lands. And I, I like to reflect on that because, you know, we um, we work many of us in settler colonial institutions that uh, demand a certain um, lack of connection to territory, right? This ability to kind of float um, and, and uh, a lack of relationality, which is sort of the exact opposite of what I wanna talk about today. Um, I wanted to open by asking how everybody is doing and if you feel comfortable sharing how you're feeling today in the chat, I welcome it. I'm a bit discombobulated with a, a kiddo home and all the other sort of competing demands on, on time. Um, it's hard to kind of uh, center and, and focus on any one individual task. And I particularly like to check in and genuinely ask how people are doing because um, we spend a lot of time in these sort of like very screeny interactions <laughs> where we present information kind of at each other, um, which again is not often as maybe relational as we might hope for our, particularly our educational interactions to be. So. I hope that if you feel comfortable, you'll genuinely share how you're feeling in the chat um, and reflect on the and a multitude of effective experiences that we bring to these sessions as, as, as actual whole human beings in whole human bodies, um, which again, I think our institutions would prefer we forget about a lot of the time. Um, I'm hungry. I am also getting hungry and it's not even lunchtime in BC. It's like in the morning still, but I am also hungry. Um, okay. So I am very interested in educational technology support, which is what I do, primarily faculty support, although I do get the pleasure of working with students as well. Um, I'm interested in that support work as care work uh, and thinking about it that way and thinking about how to center care in the practice of educational technologies. And um, we hold office hours like this at TRU. Uh, I hold four, four hours of office hours a week. My colleagues do as well. Um, during the pandemic, a sort of upswing as we first transitioned to online and for that first fully online year, we were holding six to eight, sometimes 10 hours of office hours every week. And the thing that I really came to realize was that our community of faculty were very much using that as a place to um, vent, check in, make sure they were feeling like they were on the right track and get centered. And, um, and, and a, uh, a faculty member said to me at the end of one session, she said, oh, I always feel so much better after I talk to you. And I said, oh, that's really nice. And then she left and I was like, oh, maybe this is why I'm burning out because this is kind of like the whole campus is therapy session. So that, that thinking about my work as care work has really helped me to um, consider what my own priorities are in the work that I do. And so I very much appreciate Mehabeli's definition of care pedagogy as relational, right? Pedagogy that's relational and pedagogy that includes concern for the person. And I think that that's like a straightforward thing to conceptualize in the classroom, right? We're in the classroom and we're showing respect and consideration for the individual learners in the room. But sometimes when we're creating OER, which can feel a little bit like a one-sided thing, like I'm developing this thing that I'm then pushing out into a world as opposed to a relational um, project, it can maybe be a little less explicit or let's clear how we center care in the work of actually just developing OER. So I've got a couple of strategies I'm going to suggest and I'm hoping that together we can think through um, some strategies for centering care in OER development in the same way we might expect of ourselves in a classroom setting. So things like centering access first and foremost um, something can't be used by students who can't access it. And I do believe that centering access is a key component of centering care. Um, and these strategies don't have to be 
difficult or they don't, you know, they don't have to be um, complicated. I mean, yes, the, the learning all the nuances and ins and outs of UDL, for example, is a project that one undertakes as part of their professional practice. But I think there are small things, right? Making sure videos that we include are captioned, using proper header functions instead of just straight up text, right? So that screen readers can navigate through the documents we create. Um, checking our H5P objects for accessibility. Ivana mentioned the idea of uh, fully on the offline functionality for we certainly have tons of rural learners here at TRU so thinking about you know if I'm going to include an H5P object because I want some interactivity in my OER um, what does the offline learner experience can we create like a, a printout of the same exercise that they can do by hand this kind of thing you know attending to contrast and alt text these are all really important key pieces of demonstrating care for the myriad of learners who are going to come to our text. Um, I think the trauma-informed approaches are also useful here, particularly if your OER contains difficult or triggering content, thinking about how you orient the, the reader or the user to that content um, and doing so in a trauma-informed way is really helpful. And um, Karen Ray Costa has some great resources available for like thinking through um, trauma-informed pedagogies and, and in online spaces, which I think can be helpful here as well. I also think that centering care in our OER development can involve things like ensuring that we build in space for reflection when we're creating, whether it's a textbook or an exercise, um, and especially reflection that encourages the learner to make connections to their own life and lived experience, right? Not only does that help the the content feel relevant to the learner, but it also suggests to the learner that even in this sort of asynchronous relationship, I, as the content creator, am interested in you as the person and how this, this content applies to your life. I also think that we can demonstrate care by, by creating space for localization and, and indigenization when we share our text into the world. So how does this text get adopted? Locally, is there space to recognize the people who, who live and work and breathe in the space where this text is actually going to be used? Um, and then finally, and I think really importantly, centering care in our OEL, in our OER development involves building in space for feedback from learners. And I think oftentimes our OER processes are really good at like, we often have built-in structures to do peer review or check in with colleagues or get reflective uh, feedback back from colleagues, but building in the space for learners to reach out to you with feedback about an OER, I think is an incredibly valuable step in, in a learner-centered text um, that also lets learners know that their experience of OER is, is of value, right? And that we we want, want that feedback and we want to take it on board and use it. That also means though, you know, never ask a question that you don't know how to deal with the answer to. So you need, in, if you're going to ask for feedback, right, working into a workflow or um, a revision process, how that feedback will be used is really important. Um, but I think it's a central piece that sometimes is, is missing from the institutional processes is that learner feedback piece. Um, I hope I didn't go over. I'm going to hand it off to Nicholas and he can um, share his thoughts. So thanks so much, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much, Rena. Um, and thank you for having me. I appreciate this. Uh, the University of Denver um, and where I currently um, live uh, resides on the land of um, the Ute, Arapaho, and Cheyenne uh, peoples um, way before I was here or my grandparents. Um, I, I, this is a great group. Um, I really appreciated the work, the acknowledged Brenna's focus on care. Um, Ivana's focus on personas. I intended to speak to those things um, in practice, kind of. Uh, so I won't do that. I'll get a little more um, philosophical, I guess, with you all as I approach um, and kind of less practical. So, uh, and I hope all of it ties together a lot of um, all of our thoughts. That it was a really great um, three little um, share outs there. So I really appreciate that. Uh, I guess for me, I, I think of maybe because in college I read a lot of, I took a lot of humanities courses and I read a lot of Edward Said and, and um, the Occident and uh, Orientalism and that kind of thing. Um, I, and so otherness 
in, in our work and not othering our students um, and bringing belonging um, to our classrooms through care and a sense of, of, of belonging has been pretty, I've tried to make it as practical as possible, especially initial conversations with um, maybe not outcome conversations, sitting down and figuring out outcomes of the course, and, uh, but maybe, and even then there's some opportunity for reflection. Uh, but I like, I think I like to have instructors think about and almost use personas um, and frame it around how can we make sure that they feel like they belong. Um, and belonging shows up in a couple of ways. Um, a sense of belonging is defined as being accepted, valued, included, and encouraged uh, by others, teachers and peers um, in spaces, right? Uh, so a uh, sense of belonging is, can be related to students' cognition, um, affect, and kind of behaviors. And in other words, students can think, feel, and act as they belong. Um, this sense of belonging can help them connect and engage, um, think and feel like their students, um, feel like they belong in the classroom. Um, and at the same time, knowing that belonging can come and go, they can feel, they can feel like they belong here in this class, reading this book, engaging with these students and in this instructor, and in another class, they may not have that experience or in a larger space, the, the college space, the university space, they may not have that sense of belonging. Um, so if we design within consideration of, of, of having our students see themselves, um, whether that is through visuals that represent many students, many people um, in our course designs and our pages and our chosen images and imagery, um, opportunity to reflect and think about and bring their uh, context and experiences into um, the chapter or into the page or the lesson. Um, th that's a really practical fashion, just some good, really reflective, essential questioning um, that brings them in and pulls them in. Um, makes the reading less just page after page, 30 pages of reading. And how did you bring this? What do you see? What, did, what were your steps? Does, is this the same experience that you had? Um, growing up, or is, does this resonate with you? Those types of questions can can help bring the students feeling in and bring them into um, the learning and learning experience. Um, and then the behaviors. And I work uh, primarily with, as a teaching and learning specialist. I do quite a bit of uh, course design and curriculum design. Um, and uh, but I also work uh, a good half of my work is just with instructors um, while they teach kind of instruction, instructional, I like to tell them I'm a partner in teaching and learning, but also an instructional designer on the fly. And a lot of my work is just helping them to engage student, students throughout the learning experience, create opportunities, um, not just invite student experience and student opinion on materials, but embrace it. Let's plan to take action. Let's plan to, um, you know, in week, in, in the first quarter of the class, uh, they don't feel like the reading um, resonates with them or the experiences aren't super relevant. Well, how can we work to make those more relevant, more uh, bring them back into the materials? Um, a lot of that is with a good facilitator, good instructor. And instructors play facilitator and designer um, as they teach in my, in my, my mind. Um, let's see, what else did I wanna talk about? I feel like uh, you, you all hit on so much. I also love to do, I just did a presentation last week where I brought in our, um, uh, our Office of uh, Disabilities and I had them share out on UDL. I didn't say a word. I love universal design for learning, but I felt like I, they, the student, the services, um, student services needed to be the one to speak and, and and uh, share that opinion and it landed quite well. And I've, I've gotten emails, I have conversations um, coming with instructors around uh, impl implementing UDL because they heard it from someone who wasn't me, some, from the students, from the people servicing the students. Um, and that was, that was massively impactful um, in comparison to my own you know, participation in UDL workshops in the past. So, um, bringing that them in as in students into the process in this kind of belonging framing um, can be a very powerful thing. And centering care uh, through the COVID um, 
as, as Brenna mentioned, uh, has been huge as well. So I hope I tied some of this together. Um, I, I, was, I really appreciate the speakers before me. They laid some great groundwork. Thank you, Nicholas, and thank you, Ivana, Veronica, and Brenna for sharing such um, thoughtful insight and guidance for all of us as we consider creating a sense of belonging and, and a student-centered experience. So this is the time when uh, we turn to all of you to direct and guide the conversation based on your own reflections, your own lived experience, or what you're trying to accomplish locally. So please feel free to um, pop questions into the chat or unmute. We're, I think, an intimate enough group here that should be pretty easy to have a conversation. So I see Caitlin uh, put something in the chat here. We spoke a lot about care work in today's session. I wonder if each of you can speak to what the biggest barriers for you have been in applying these approaches in the process. Um, I'll start if that's okay. I think that... Um... I think that everybody is either burnt out or burning out <laughs> and care is um care is sustaining and care is valuable and care can fill us up but care is also a very particular form of labor that is emotionally taxing and um I went to uh, a session on sort of trauma-informed approaches to burnout at like this time last year um, with Karen Ray Costa. And, you know, she said like, how do you know when you're burning out? And I recognized in that session that for me, it's often like when my patience begins to ebb, <laughs> when my capacity for care feels like it is. So there are all kinds of institutional structural issues like many of our institutions are are in an um in an austerity mode at the moment an audacity mode too a little bit but um, <laughs> an austerity mode at the moment and uh i think many of us are experiencing extremely heavy workloads and a lack of um appropriate staffing the the demands for classroom instructors of multimodal teaching that many people are either taking on either institutionally required or because they want to reach their students in this very complex moment. Like these are things that are um, impacting everyone's ability to care. <laughs> and I think that, um, yeah, I think that that's gonna continue to be an issue because um, we don't actually get over burnout very easily, right? So. Anna, Nicholas, Veronica, any barriers that you see that you wanted to highlight? Um, I think um, one of the barriers that I've, I've encountered is time, because um, courses usually are packed with content and with, the, with activities, with assignments, and there's not enough time to build relationships or to reflect on what's going on, on what we're learning and and um, and, and connect with one another. And when I've spoken with some uh, indigenous students, that's what, what was one of their biggest, biggest concerns, that uh, there was basically no space for uh, for for relationship building and for um, for showing that, that we care for one another. So I think a very important consideration is to perhaps include a, a, a pause week, right? A slow week in a course some, somewhere halfway through because um, you know, face-to-face -face courses have reading weeks, online courses, at least the ones that I've, um, I've taken and, and I've you know, designed with, with the instructors um, never had um, a, a, a reading week, right? But I think it would be a good practice to introduce and also uh, give students this opportunity to to slow down, to uh, to check where they are, and um, and and uh, and care for that for themselves and for others. Um, I think a a barrier that I've seen in the work of uh, creating communities of care is that historically, um, as Brenna said, having a body hasn't been okay in the, in, the, in the academy and in institutions of higher learning. 
the, we've, we've privileged very Western, very white, very um, historically masculine understandings of what it means to study and engage in, in the work of building knowledge. And so I think a barrier is having a body, <laughs> um, having kids, having feelings, having emotions, having disappointment and managing trauma. Um, and I think a solution to that is, is to acknowledge the burnout, um, to acknowledge the disappointment, and especially in working with instructors to make it okay for them to disclose that um, they are also struggling alongside their students. Um, I think a, a barrier to actually receiving care is to feel like I don't deserve it. I'm, I'm not worthy. Uh, there's something wrong with me. That's why I'm so tired or that's why I'm not learning. Um, and I think normalizing struggle right now, especially, is, is a collective solution. Um, and being honest about where our institutions have failed us. Um, like the audacity of operating on austerity, <laughs> I think is, is a really important link. Um, because it means that students are, are taking on more of the burden, instructors are taking on more of the burden, and our institutions are, are chugging along rather than inviting pause or rather than inviting um, recognition. So um, I think that that's, that's, that's huge, that's collective. No individual can, can address that alone. Um, but I think speaking the truth about what we've been managing and how it, it's not separated from our desire to offer students what they need, our desire to offer ourselves what I need is connect, what we need is connected to it. Um, yeah. Well, and I see in the chat, a sh a shamelessly sharing an essay. Oh, cool. On digital, feminist digital pedagogy. Thanks, Brenna. Um, I will also sharelessly shame in the chat or sharelessly shame. Uh, shamelessly share in the chat. Um, we had the good fortune of hosting Mahabali uh, as our keynote speaker with Open Oregon Educational Resources this past Friday. And um, Maha's uh, uh, talk is recorded and openly licensed. And I invite you to um, review it and sit with it. Um, one, I think, one of the strengths I think Maha brings is the ability to um, normalize and validate where you are and what you're managing and see that as a strength connected to your work. So share that in the chat as well. Veronica, and I'll try to drop in a link to Maha's blog because I know Brenna, you referenced that earlier and I'm also gonna drop in a link maybe to Katarina Costa's Twitter for those of you on Twitter so you can uh, learn more and continue this conversation uh, outside of this hour too. We're sort of nearing in the end of, of our hour, but I wanted to uh, invite more questions to the room and while folks are thinking, um, uh, ask this one from Michelle. Uh, Michelle appreciates the recommendation to include opportunities for reflection. I know, Nicholas, you mentioned that. Uh, I think all four of our speakers talked about different ways to encourage uh, self-reflection from learners and uh, incorporate those opportunities uh, into any type of teaching design. Uh, do you have any thoughts around how to do that well or how to do that at all? I don't want to yeah. do it first every time. So, oh, good, Nicholas, you go first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I'm a big fan of, uh, and have been for a very long time, of portfolio, or sorry, uh, journaling and having um, kind of a journal as maybe not a, a major assessment, but I often frame it as critical thinking, um, not for the sake of critical thinking, but for the sake of them making the learning their own um, and connecting it to what they're doing in their work, in their life um, and uh, why they're taking the class and that kind of thing. Uh, I, it worked really well a long time ago when I was teaching math in a, in a turnaround, a dropout high school, and I just kept it I kept working with it through um, my teaching experience in, in higher ed. And um, I think that works if you have the time and space that could show up as exit surveys. If it's like a hybrid in person or um, a Google form, uh, uh, if you're asynchronous or um, that kind of thing. I, I've also used it to and gotten permission to share journals with um, other groups of students to help them see other people who they may feel a sense of um, connection to um, through the course. So on the front end of the course, I'll share some journals 
um, exemplars or, or uh, things like that and, and, and just kind of share them up front. Um, and that, that's kind of a bigger practice. I think you could also incorporate questions into, um, if you're designing some OER, um, you could end each chapter with some reflective questions or, or kind of embed them throughout um, to, to have them really to stop and pause and take a moment. Um, I do that in my synchronous Zoom class. I, I have a slide in every deck where I, in, during COVID, well, when we were locked up, not to say that COVID's over, but the, when, we were, when we were all locked down, um, I had a slide that where I would stop and say, hey, I want to take a moment and acknowledge, you know, and let's take some time to reflect here on how we're feeling and how we're doing and what we may need um, extra. Um, so if you're teaching Zoom, I plug it into a slide deck. Um, yeah, I think those are some good examples. I have no research to support this assertion, but I think there is great value when we're creating OER of devoting actual physical space, textbook, page, real estate to the act of reflection. Um, and this comes from, you know, my previous life before faculty support, I spent nine years as a composition, primarily composition instructor at a community college in New West, in that, sorry, in the, the lower mainland of British Columbia. And um, one of the things I realized is like there in that, doing that work is that there's like a world of difference between like, pull out a piece of paper, do this exercise, and here's a handout do this exercise, right? Like those feel like very different things. And there's something about the act of devoting space, real estate and resources on our part to signal importance. Um, and so I'm a big believer in not just a question in the OER, but like space to make notes. Um, and this is something that I've been um, increasingly using uh, the H5P documentation tool to do. Um, in online resources because it very nicely and kind of tidily creates this little journaling space for students that they can then export as a text file, but it is exclusively their own. It doesn't get logged anywhere. It doesn't come back to you. Um, and so I find that a nice middle ground um, as a way to signal the significance and importance of reflective practice. Like, look, I'm devoting actual space to this thing that you can just click and type in um, and not then having to mark it if I'm an instructor and I don't also want to just get an avalanche of paper in. So that's my little plug for the documentation tool, which I think is, I think H5P is underused in writing instruction generally, but that tool in particular, I find very useful. Um, I wanted to share uh, a document from the uh, Southern uh, Poverty Law Center, Social Justice Standards for Learning for Justice, Anti-Bias Framework. This is a K through 12 um, document that's intended to help instructors uh, to identify learning objectives that are related to domains um, that are traditionally perhaps overlooked or not centered when we think about course level objectives. Um, so around identity, around justice, uh, diversity, and action. And this is um, some rights reserved copyright, and I've reached out to them to ask a little bit more about what it means for adaptation. Um, haven't heard back yet, but I can report back. Um, I really, really appreciate the effort to um, create an intention around student reflection um, that's made possible when you're incorporating objectives that specifically ask students, for example, to recognize stereotypes and relate them and relate to people as individuals rather than representations of groups. Um, I think setting objectives that are set in these domains that are relational, um, that are around identity development, actually allow you to align assessments like student reflection or connecting their lived experience to the content um, in really aligned ways. Um, so that's a, a project that I'm really interested in as I'm working with instructors is to help um, them to identify unit level or chapter level um, or module level objectives that speak to the core of the learning they want students to do um, and advance uh, the inclusion in their field. I was in a great conversation last week in Open Ed Week um, with an instructor who wasn't sure how to um, build an assignment around marginalized voices in the history of invention. Um, and that's not necessarily something that comes fluently uh, if, if you haven't had that experience in your own education or you're modeling the kind of teaching that you yourself received as a student. 
And so thinking about how your course level objectives themselves could invite students to reveal and share their own expertise, their own knowledge, and what they bring into the space, um, especially as, as you're threading through assessments. Um, I think that would be a fabulous best practice. Thank you all for your thoughts. We have another question. This one's from Amy. She's wondering if any of you have successes to share about championing equity and OER at an institutional level. I will add another question as uh, you consider that one. Um, we've been talking a lot about how we can support students. I wonder if in your work um, there are techniques or practices for sort of demonstrating or encouraging students to support one another in a class and what that looks like. That's a kind of behavior that can be encouraged and supported through the, the class experience. Thank you, Phoebe. I can tackle the institutional question. Sure. Um, one, one thing that we've done uh, as a team in uh, Open Oregon Educational Resources is we've intentionally hired an equity consultant as part of the leadership team in our targeted pathway grant development. Um, so we are uh, uh, investing uh, our time and our collaboration in working uh, with a, an expert who will hold us accountable to our values. Um, and this, this is not something that I think uh, institutions can easily uh, like mobilize around because it does take funding and it does take uh, senior leadership investment, but it is uh, something that uh, teams can ask and advocate for. Um, often the a DEI unit on your campus, uh, especially following the murder of George Floyd and worldwide protests, or at least this, this was the case at the University of Oregon, they were flooded with requests for collaboration and flooded with uh, the, the need um, for guidance. And thinking about how you can take ownership or responsibility within your unit, following the lead or aligned with the goals that are developed by your DEI unit um, and share the burden of that work um, might be a way to approach it. And if you do have funding, if you do have um, uh, the possibility of partnering with an equity consultant to leap on it, um, because that uh, having just like an advocate on a search who's dedicated to thinking through equity as, as you're moving through your projects, having an equity consultant on a grant who is not necessarily involved in a, a given institution um, and can offer a fresh sight on, on the work you're doing and the processes and structures you're setting up, um, yeah, is definitely a gain for the project. Thanks, Veronica. So um, we're getting a few farewells and appreciative notes in the chat um, for this conversation. Um, we have just a couple minutes left, and so I'll open it up and see if anyone, our guests, our attendees, uh, has any closing thoughts or um, things they would like to share or, or a Perva, anything I'd like to add, gonna, Brenna? Well, I'm just going to share a link in the chat on the, on the um... The last question. Um, we've had a lot of movement. I feel like success is too strong a word. We've had a lot of movement on the issue of indigenization and decolonization at our institution. Um, and one resource that's been particularly um, good, I think, for those of us working in faculty support and instructional design has been the BC Campus um, Pulling Together Guide for Curriculum Developers. And they frequently run um, uh, workshop sessions over uh, like online, like virtual workshop sessions on this material. They do it for different, uh, so pulling together is like a series, a professional learning series, and you can take it as a leader or as an instructor, but um, the curriculum developer guide, I think is particularly good. So I've just shared that in the chat in case it's useful to anyone's context. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Brenna. Ivana, Nicholas, did you have any final comments or questions or thoughts you wanted to share before we wrap up? Um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to come speak to you all and hear your own and, and collaborate with you all. It's all about people and keeping 
um, are student-centered and uh, building a sense of care and belonging um, and not othering anyone and, and centering um, disability ability, centering those components as we move forward and not othering them and, set their, and pushing them away. So um, thank you all so much for, for letting me be here and share with you. Um, I would love to invite anyone to drop into the chat um, since we're just coming out of open ed week. Um, any uh, specific session that you attended that you want everyone to attend, especially something that focuses or centers on students or equity. I want like a whole stack of uh, other uh, opportunities that I might not know, yet know about. So if you're comfortable, like thinking through everything that you uh, learned <laughs> last week, it was a lot. Um, and having a little chatter fall of uh, opportunities to engage and learn and grow around equity and open education. I would love that personally. Thank you for that invitation, Veronica. And I will use that as an opportunity to note that we have a discussion uh, space on the Rebus community. And so if you're not able to think of an event that you attended immediately, and it comes to you at some point as this week progresses, feel free to drop in those recommendations there and we can have a public facing list to go back to when we find ourselves with a spare hour to, to catch up and reflect on um, uh, presentations from last week. I also wanted to uh, use this time um, before I thank our guests and thank everybody here to throw in another opportunity for reflection just in the spirit of uh, our discussion and conversation today. Uh, these office hour spaces are very much designed for community and I would love and I know Karen would as well to hear from you all um, if there were other challenges that you've had that you want to explore as a community if there's topics that you want to revisit if there are people you want to hear from uh, other guests you would like so I've dropped in a link to a very simple form we really appreciate your suggestions. In fact, our past two or three session topics have been community suggested. Uh, and I believe next month, we're going to be chatting a little bit about um, more sharing and showing off the work, uh, inviting guests to talk about tools for reporting impact. But um, we don't have any other sessions planned for the rest of the year. So you really can take control of, of what these events and conversations look like. That form will be saved in the chat and shared on the forum for those who need it. We are at the hour, so I just want to ask everybody to please join me in thanking all four of our guests. Um, and thank you all as well for contributing your questions, your reflections and thoughts and resources in this conversation. As always, I'm looking forward to continuing this discussion in the forum, but also at uh, future office hours events. And I hope that everybody can get a a uh, short or perhaps longer break uh, as we hit the hour and look after yourselves as the week goes by. Take care and thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for this invitation. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank really you. This was really fun. Group.